Mark Robinson, the Senior VP of Business and Legal. Larry Mustel, Primary Wave. Colleen Ice, the COO of The Orchard. Welcome to our continuing seminars here at uh, William Patterson University. Um, this year we decided to focus on very important, strong female executives in the music side of the entertainment world. And tonight we're really lucky because when Dr. Marconi first presented the idea, like, let's, let's do important, powerful women this semester, I was like, hmm, okay, and you know, you always have to take the first step forward, and I was like, mm. so <clears throat> somebody I knew who I'd worked with many years ago was kind enough, and she's here tonight, she said yes, and that sort of gave me the, um, the guts to move forward and continue uh, pursuing people to be here and uh, help us explore the opportunities and the history of uh, women in the uh, music business. So tonight our guest is um, Julie Swidler and she is the Executive Vice President of Business Affairs and General Counsel for Sony Music Entertainment. And it's a big, big job. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to have known her, but I think I should mention a couple of things so we know how important she really is. Um, <laughs> Uh -oh. Julie's on the board of the uh, Record Industry Association of America. Um, she was singled out not only in Billboard numerous times um, in their Power 100 executives, but also Elle magazine had you on a, on a power list. I, um, I think I knew that. <laughs> she's uh, a big deal in the T.J. Martell organization, which is the music industry's charity for uh, cancer and, and leukemia. And most recently, and probably most relevant to some of the things we're talking about, is she's on the uh, task force of the uh, Recording Academy's uh, diversity uh, uh, organization. Um, at the point now where, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're looking to find the next president of that Although we're not doing that. That's we're, really up to the board of the Recording Academy. Our focus is really issues of diversity and inclusion. Hopefully that hopefully our recommendations will lead them to the right answer. But um, but I'm sure we're, we're more focused on issues of diversity and inclusion. I'm sure you're all uh, <coughs> well, I would think you might be aware of the comments made by the outgoing uh, person um, who uh, made the foolish statement of telling women they have to step, step it up. Mm -hmm. It's like, really? Hmm. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, it uh, certainly will be a benchmark in his career as he uh, moves along. Um, so I usually like to start by asking, aside from allowing me to schlep you out to Wayne, New Jersey, how did you start? How did, what was, I mean, okay, so Julie Swidler, um, before you got married, you were in high school, obviously went to what, Un Union College for undergrad? Yep. So you wanna tell us how that, that evolved? Uh, yeah, I think that I've always been passionate about music. I, in high school, I played three different instruments. I, uh, when I was in college, I was a DJ for three years, starting my sophomore year. I actually ran a college coffee house where um, I would, I, everybody laughs now because I would do the contracts between the college and the artists that we would hire to perform <laughs> at the coffee house. And I basically performed a lot of functions. One was creative in deciding who should perform at the coffee house. The other was marketing to get people to come uh, and uh, managing, making sure that we collected the money and, and et cetera. So that was an amazing opportunity that I did for the last two years of my college career. So I, I think music has always been a, 
an incredibly important part of what I did, but I didn't know that what I do for a living now existed. I had no clue. Like when people start talking to me about how they interned at different record companies, I just wasn't, I had no opportunity to even find out that those things existed. So when I went to law school, I decided to go to law school because I thought, I'm not talented enough to make it as a musician, singer, et cetera, but maybe there's some way to get into the business through law. And I was very interested in law. What was your undergraduate degree in? Political science, which I always say was extremely helpful in any company you ever work with, is to study politics. Um, but I joke about how I had two majors in college. One was my academic major, which was political science, and one was my extracurricular major, which was mostly focused on music or something music related. And so uh, towards the end of my law school career, I really wanted to work in entertainment and work in law firm maybe that focused on entertainment because again, I had no clue that music companies actually have lawyers. And I went, somebody uh, got me an introduction to a guy who had started out as a lawyer and was then president of Orion Pictures. And Orion Pictures has been merged into other movie companies over the years. And I asked him about what my steps could be. And he said to me, you know, there's a lot of lawyers in entertainment but there aren't very many good ones. He mm. said, learn how to go be, go and learn how to be a good lawyer first and then figure out how to get into entertainment. So I went to a big firm and also at the time that I graduated from law school, big firms were really the main places that women were hired. It was big law firms, it was, um, like the public defender's office, the uh, Manhattan DA, but small law firms generally, which is where all the entertainment work was happening, were not hiring women. And it never occurred to me until I must have applied to every entertainment related company, uh, law firm in the city of New York as a third year law student. And I was fortunate, I had done really well, so it wasn't like, my, my grades were good, et cetera. I was rejected from every single one. And I started looking at the letterheads of these firms and I realized there was not one woman on any of these letterheads. And I think that was the first time it kind of hit me because it never really, when I was in college, even though there were more men than women at my college, I just didn't think about it. That was like the first time that I think I thought about Oh, this woman thing. <laughs> there's, it, there's, there's an effect. Um, so I went to a large law firm, and I worked there for two years, and then I went to a smaller firm that focused more on entertainment. Well, the first law firm, what was their specialty? Um, it was really all across the board, but I thought they had some entertainment, and their entertainment was they represented both the New York Yankees and the New York Mets. <laughs> so that was the first, quote, entertainment that I got involved with. But for the New York Yankees, it was at one point, um, I don't know how many of you will actually even remember these players. Reggie Jackson, there was something called a pine tar incident. Mm -hmm. And there was a dispute as to whether there was enough pine tar on his bat. So suddenly I knew all of the Major League Baseball rules inside and out. Um, then I went to a smaller firm uh, that focused mainly on advertising, um, and then I went to a, another big firm, and finally my first in-house job was at J. Walter Thompson, which is one of, which was at the time one of the biggest uh, ad agencies in the world, yep. and they had a music publishing group, they did television production, they did advertising as well. Um, and I loved being in-house. And unfortunately, less than a year after I got there, it was the first hostile takeover in advertising history. There were eight of us in that department. Seven of us were let go. 
So the next thing I knew, I was on an unemployment line because I didn't have a lot of money. And everybody said to me, go to unemployment. You, you've been paying unemployment insurance the whole time you've been working. And I thought, really, that's what it was for? <laughs> and I, I'm on this unemployment line in tears, like thinking it's the end of my life, of course. And I didn't want to really go back to law firms. I really loved being in-house. And I started networking as much as I possibly could. Anybody that I had met over the past several years, I would call, I would write, and eventually, making a very long story short, I ended up at Polygram Records. And they hired me as a senior attorney, and that was 31 years ago. So, um, that's how I got into the music business finally. And I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, you never understand what life is gonna bring you. And here I was like on this unemployment line and I ended up finding, a, really finding my career. How did, how, did, <clears throat> how did they recommend you to get to Polygram? I mean, was there some connection or was it? Yeah, it was, um, I, it was through all this different networking. I actually met with a lawyer at a law firm that did some work for Polygram, and they knew they were looking for a senior lawyer, and that was how I got there. So I always try explaining to the class that it's a grapevine business, and you, you look to your left, you look to your right, and you see who are some of the people that you see today. You might be working with them, and you just, you never know. It's true. And you can't afford to alienate yourself from somebody or piss somebody off. And you just never know. I know in my work condition, uh, situation rather, I work with a lot of people who are much younger than me, and I give them the same amount of respect I'd give anybody else because mm -hmm. one of them could wind up uh, being a president of a company and, and want to procure my services and stuff. So I, I think the, the lesson here is always, and, and, and Julie's just explained it, is got to be nice to everybody. You just never know. You just never know because as you hear her story, you'll see the connections and different people along the way that she's met here and there and some have helped and some she's had to help and it's, uh, it's an interesting. I, I think dynamic. I find myself, people have told me that sometimes if somebody let, gets let go, I'm one of the first people that always calls them and it's because I went through that experience. I know what that was like and how hard it is, especially the first few weeks after you get let go. I, when my first job at Atlantic Records, I don't forget, the, uh, a veteran uh, promotion executive said to me, so, you want a safe job, huh? Well, that's not the business you're in. You want a safe job, go get a job teaching school. But, you know, he said you're going to hit a lot of road bumps along the way, and um, he was right. Another friend who was a music executive had a, had a philosophy and a theory that if you don't change your job every couple of years, you're a loser. And I don't know if I subscribe to that, but I do see a lot of people who have careers and they keep jumping from position to position. Um, obviously, Julie had to do a lot of jumping around in the beginning to find the right situation. But So Polygram, which unfortunately is not an entity that exists today and, and as a standalone, but so you got hired as a senior attorney there. Yeah, I did. So I, um, when I first got to Polygram, it was mainly just a, a recorded music company and they were also just starting a publishing company. So I really learned how to um, draft and negotiate recording agreements and publishing agreements and I had to learn about the publishing business as well as the recorded music business at the same time. And I was always the type of person too that if I was negotiating a deal, before I could say yes or no, I felt like I wanted to understand why I was saying yes or no. So I literally sat with people in the department that made sure that all of our recording costs were paid. And I sat and said, okay, why do we pay the producers this way? How does it work? How do you budget albums? And I would sit with the people in marketing and say, okay, we give out discounts. Why do we give out discounts? What does it mean? So that I could explain when I was negotiating deals that I'm saying yes here because X, but I'm saying no because you don't really want me to say yes, and let me explain why. And so I think 
that helped me along the way. And then the next thing we knew, Polygram was buying more labels, and then they decided to move into the video distribution business. And so I learned about video distribution. And we actually had some huge success with the NFL on videos called NFL Rocks, NFL Country, NFL Pop. And believe it or not, those videos sold millions and millions of units. Um, and then we started a content business, a video content business. So my son keeps laughing because I'm an IMDB as a special thank you on a video called Rock Video Girls, <laughs> which is probably nowadays would be considered softcore porn. Um, and uh, we started doing pay-per-view television. Uh, and so I had to learn the television business. And I remember calling a friend who worked at uh, VH1, and I said, I'll take you out to lunch if you explain <laughs> these, these definitions for me on how you get paid. Um, and so I will never forget that we did a show, Guns N' Roses Live in Paris, which, you know, Guns N' Roses wasn't signed to our company, but we, are the, we were the ones that decided to do this pay-per-view. Guns N' Roses were huge at the time. And so the only thing we were worried about is the title was Guns N' Roses Live in Paris, which meant that Axl Rose had to literally get on stage at a particular time, otherwise there would be dead air across Europe. Well, given who Axl Rose is, he basically stared down our producer for seven minutes before he got on stage, just to screw with them. <laughs> and so there was dead air for seven minutes across Europe. Um, but it allowed me to become broader in my experience. We bought a merchandise company, so I had to learn the merch business, which was different, very different, than recorded music. Um, so we were doing all of these things that culminated. We were just, Steve and I were talking about it um, when we were driving here, because Polygram was the co-producer of the 25th anniversary of Woodstock. It's hard for me to believe it's going to be the 50th now. Um, and so basically, I was the lead lawyer at the time. So we worked on all of the artist agreements, but we also worked on agreements for porta potties. And we had to get this, the land, we had to get the permits, not just from Saugerties, but from the Saugerties Fire Department, from the Albany County Fire Department, from the state of New York Fire Department. Every single police group, we had to pay all of them. Um, but we couldn't pay, right? So somehow the city of Saugerties fire department got all brand new ATVs. Don't ask me why they needed ATVs, but suddenly they got all ATVs. Um, we did a deal with Pepsi to put the logo, the Woodstock logo on 2 million Pepsi cans um, and had to make sure that they had their own special Pepsi tent behind the stages. Uh, and so I was up in the mud for about a week before the concert, making sure that everything was done and ready. We had a couple of other people with us, but I was the first one up there. And you know, we started opening our computers and ants were coming out of them. And we had the guy who was the head of our security force basically had a breakdown in the, like right before the concert started, so we had to bring in another security company. Um, it was quite interesting. And in the middle of all of this, I, about two months before the concert, I found out I was pregnant with my third kid. <laughs> so I'm in Woodstock, in the middle of the mud, pregnant, not telling anybody, because it was really early and I also knew all the guys I worked with would be like, oh crap, we have to be nice to her. Um, <laughs> and so uh, my husband, unbeknownst to me, my husband actually called one of the guys I was working with and just said, she's not telling anybody, but I'm telling you she's oh. pregnant. Will you make sure she eats? Um, and then he came up for the weekend because we were, uh, the people that were working on the concert, we had hotel rooms literally across the street. 
But there was a couple of times I was a little scared walking in the mud back to this uh, little hotel across the street. So that kind of, that, that, I always talk about that as one of the best and worst experiences I ever had because there was so much involved, there was so much work involved, but it really brought together so much of what I had learned up until that point. And then shortly after that, I, um, one of the guys I worked with very closely was this guy named Ed Eckstein who was head of Mercury Records. And he was frustrated because during the um, Woodstock period, I, I really could only do that. I couldn't do much more. And I had always been like his person that helped him on his deals. So he basically said to the head of the company at the time, look, everybody else has their own business affairs department. I want my own business affairs department. And by the way, I'd like Julie to be the head of business affairs. So several months after Woodstock, I went to be head of the business affairs group at Mercury Records. So <clears throat> for everybody in this room, they weren't around 25 years ago. No. So could you share what some of the talent was that performed at that particular Woodstock in 94? Uh, Best you can recall. Uh, yes, I actually remember a lot of them. Bob Dylan, uh, Santana, Joe Cocker, uh, Nine Inch Nails, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Metallica, Aerosmith, Henry Rollins. Um, the night before, because she wasn't that big an artist yet, we had Sheryl Crow. Um, those were the, some of the ones I remember. Oh, um, Green Day. Uh, I, I, I actually just saw some of the footage recently, so, I'm, so that's why I remember some of the artists even more. And there was, a, there was an album, right? Didn't they put out an album? Yeah, we put out an album. We put out a video. We, um, album, video, there was uh, some parts of it was shown on television, um, but only parts of it. And then there was a film made that has, to this day, have never, has never come out. Um, but we had an Oscar-winning uh, documentary filmmaker who did the film. And then, just to flash forward for a moment, there was another Woodstock anniversary. I don't know if you were there for that. I wasn't involved with that one. It was five years later they did one for the 30th um, up in 99. Buffalo, I think. And there was a fire, and it was fairly disastrous. That was where they had the expensive I was very well. happy not to be involved with that one. So you mentioned that uh, you were pregnant for the third time. So where does your personal life enter this equation? Because you had, you're bouncing around all these law firms and you, you're seeking all these opportunities. You know, not to sound sexist, but as a woman, you also need to have a personal life. And how did, how did that blend in there? Um, I was pretty lucky that I started dating my husband about a year before I, not quite a year, before I started at Polygram. And I always joked that he wanted to make sure I was gainfully employed before he asked me to marry him. So <laughs> it was um, the weekend, right, the weekend after I started at Polygram is when I got engaged. And I got married that September. And I had my first child I'm trying to remember, like a year and a half later. So I always joke about how the first five years I was in the music business, I was pregnant too. Like I felt like I was pregnant every other minute. Um, and always your focus is your family. But it it's, gets hard sometimes because especially when you're at work, you're really focused on work and it's very easy to get caught up. But I think sometimes my family helped me be better at my job. It helped me to focus more at work. Um, it gave me a lot of perspective because it's so easy to get caught up in your job, especially when you really like your job. And I think that's the same for men and women as far as uh, really enjoying your job and getting caught up in it. And it's almost like your family kind of pulls you back 
they're the ones that keep you together. And I also, you know, I work in the music business, so there are lots of children <laughs> that I deal with. Um, even if they're 50 years old or 60 years old or 30 years old. So I think having those kids really helped <laughs> figuring out how to deal with kids at work as well. It's not, a, it's not an age issue, it's a mindset. It is a mindset, it's definitely a mindset. So during your journey at the various other entertainment companies as well as your first music industry or entertainment company, we're in the Me Too world. Were there situations where you were feeling uncomfortable or you saw, I mean, you know, you said that there were no, the law firms had not hired any women. But I, I wondered if you experienced any Me Too moments or any sort of overt sexism that you're okay sharing. Yeah, I, I, luckily for me, I don't think I ever experienced an intense Me Too mom, mo, mo, the, moment. Um, sexism was pervasive. I, you know, especially if you're a mother you know, it's not even just being a woman, being a woman and a mother. I had experiences where I overheard people talk about how they didn't want to pay me as much as they paid my male counterparts because, you know, my husband was a lawyer at a, at a law firm, so why did I need to be paid equally, regardless of the work I did? Um, that's fairly sexist. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember for the longest time just keeping a Diet Coke on my desk for years so that it would throw off anybody that might think I was pregnant. Um, hmm. Because I never wanted people to think that somehow I um, was going to have children and I wasn't going to come back or work. Like I found very often I had the feeling that I had to work just a little bit harder than everybody else um, to prove that I was serious about my job. Um, and there were a couple of times where I definitely felt very uncomfortable um, in certain situations. But I, I think like a lot, and I've spoke, spoken to a lot of other women about this, it's almost as if we brushed it aside. You know, we just didn't focus on it. We didn't complain about it because I wanted to keep my job. You know, I wanted to, I didn't want to be a complainer. I didn't, um, it was almost like I felt like that's just part of it and you move forward. And as I said, I was fortunate in that, you know, we've heard some horrible stories over the last year or two. And luckily I was never, I never had to deal with that. Um, but I definitely had to deal with the but sexism over the years. But now you're on the other side of the fence and you work with a major multinational corporation and there's gonna be moments that, and you as general counsel probably have to unfortunately get involved. Uh, yes. I'm sure it's not one of the most pleasant parts of your job. No, it's definitely not the most pleasant. Um, we've had a couple of situations where it's crossed the line, and we've had to make uh, some really difficult decisions about letting someone go. And you, you know, you look at these situations where people get away with things for years and years because they're really, really talented, and how and explaining to them this behavior is no longer tolerated. It should never have been tolerated, and it was but this behavior is no longer, is just not tolerated, and you have to say goodbye. And there's situations where you say to yourself, it's idiot teenage behavior, and that deserves a really strong slap on the hand, and almost like I think to myself, what the hell were you thinking? Bad judgment. And then there's a lot of behavior, and so you, you basically send those people to training, you um, maybe dock their bonuses. There's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes that people don't always see. And then there's behavior that goes too far and you have to say goodbye. And that's not so easy. 
there's got to be some irony that you see some behavior today that you tolerated when you were in that position and now in this millennium it's not acceptable this, so that's it's not be acceptable weird. at all it it is kind of weird it's and we sometimes as i said i speak to other women and we say like what was wrong with us <laughs> right why didn't we say anything why didn't we do anything about this and you were it, afraid yeah i think i was i was afraid to lose my job sometimes it's i horrible. was afraid and i also i think i poo pooed a lot of it like i just was like you know i can deal with this it's got, it's got to be um it's 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 got to be strange in in retrospect. Yeah, and there were other as I said there were other subtle things like I I remember so well when I first started at Polygram there was a guy who was in charge who would ask different people uh to his office for a drink at the end of the day and it was always the guys. And it could be guys that were junior to me and he would ask them to come to his office for a drink at the end of the day and they would gossip and I would feel very left out because I thought to myself what are they talking about that maybe I could learn from or maybe I could um, be part of it right because you want to feel like you're part of things etc and it would frustrate the hell out of me that every year every you know almost every night they would be invited down and as i said guys who were junior to me and i'm sitting there working and they're busy drinking in this guy's office and one day he asked me to come down and i was so excited and i called my husband i was like it's the last thing i want to do is go drink you know because i had kids at home etc but i was going to be damned if i wasn't going to go right. and drink with them and I'm not a big drinker, and they're drinking scotch, and I remember as asking them for a brandy, and they're laughing at me. But there was no way I was going to miss that opportunity right. when I was finally asked to come down the hall to have a drink with them. And it was, it was relatively early in my career, but it was such a so such an important thing for me. I remember when they finally asked me. It's like I'm one. I'm one of the guys. <laughs> and was there anything there that you were enlightened to that you, or it was um, just a little bit here and there? I mean, it was it wasn't a game changer, but there's just little things that you pick up. It's like you joke about the men's room, you know. It's like little things that you pick up that you right. might not otherwise pick up if you're not in the room. I mean, that's a big thing is being invited into the room. And still, the image still sticks with me that you said you felt it was important to keep that Diet Coke can on your desk so people, I mean, that's... For years, I had that Diet Coke can on my desk, never open. So the fact that you said back in the day it was poo-pooed or it was tolerated, then you were part of a, a, a group of women who took that ad out in... Uh, a couple of publications about uh, our friends at the Recording Academy. Yeah, it was interesting. It wasn't that we took an ad out. What happened was there was a very large group of women who decided to ask for Neil's resignation, asked him to be fired. Neil is the president. Neil at Port now is the president of the Recording Academy. And, and he's been there for 12 years, and he's actually done a lot of good. He said something super dumb. And basically what he said at the time was he was being asked why there were not more women on the show last year and, and why was Lord, who was nominated for Album of the Year, yet she was the only Album of the Year nominee not asked to perform at the, at the Grammys. And he said, well, you know, if more women work really hard and really hard at their craft and step up, I'm sure they'll make it next year. And that, was a, that started a firestorm. And so many female artists complained and said, we've been stepping up. I think Pink was the first one that said, I've been stepping up for years. And this is crazy. And so there was a large group of women. I ended up being on this email chain where they were going to send this very angry letter demanding that he be fired. 
And that just didn't feel right to me. And I didn't, I didn't feel that the letter reflected my own thoughts or because it was so much bigger than that. It wasn't just about the fact that they didn't have Lord perform. It was, there weren't enough people of color involved. There weren't, there was just so much going on that they just weren't, it's almost as if they were pretty clueless about what the world was today. And so what happened was uh, Julie Greenwald, who's president of Atlantic, actually she's co-chairman of, of Atlantic Records, who Steve, you told me he, she, she, she came a couple here. of years ago, yep. um, called me up and she said, I see that you haven't made any comments on this email chain. I haven't either. I'm not going to sign unless you sign. Mm. <laughs> I said, I don't feel, first of all, I could never do it unless I talked to my company and my boss. But second of all, I said, this just doesn't feel right to me. It, there's something missing here. So she said, well, we have to do something. She said, because a lot of the women I work with are, have been coming up to me and saying, what are you going to do about this? So I also spoke to Jody Gerson, who is the head of Universal Music Publishing, and Michelle Anthony, who's an executive vice president at Universal. And I looked up who Neil reports to, and it was this board of trustees for the Recording Academy. And so I drafted a letter basically talking about how the world has changed and that we are all held accountable for our actions and, and the fans. You know, we're accountable to both our artists and the fans. And while the fans and the artists have evolved, the Recording Academy hasn't. And you really have to start taking stock of what you do, how to get more women involved, how to get more people of color involved, how to become more inclusive, because music is. That's what music is all about. Music is inclusive. Music allows people to tell their own truths, regardless of who they are. And that's not what the Recording Academy was doing. And the Recording Academy says, you know, always talks about how they represent everybody. They represent songwriters and artists and every and producers and engineers and everybody in the music ecosystem. Yet they weren't getting to the point where the world was. Um, and so uh, the six of, six of us decided to sign it. Sylvia Roan, who I also work with, who's head of Epic Records, decided to sign it. And um, Desiree Perez, who works at Rock Nation and works with Jay-Z. So the six of us decided to sign this letter. We sent it to John Papo, who's the head of the board of trustees. And Neil had already m talked about how he was going to start this uh, task force. But not much was happening. We didn't really hear anything about it. And I think one of the people that signed the letter decided to release that letter or parts of the letter to the press. And that's where it came out. And then uh, two of us ended up on the task force. But what was interesting was we didn't hear from John Papo for a while. Wow. And finally, of course, Rob, my boss, called and yelled at him <laughs> and said, these women deserve a response. Like, why haven't you responded? What was his re and what was his response? Um, well, I couldn't get in touch with, with one of them. And we've been missing each other because Julie Greenwald tried to call him. It was bad. My but we eventually had a meeting with uh, a number of them, and the task force is the result. But it was pretty embarrassing. After all that, you have six pretty powerful women, and all of a sudden, it's my boss, Rob, who calls John and says, so when are you going to respond? Doesn't make sense. Yeah. <coughs> well. Um, <coughs> all right, well, I, wanted, I wanted to get back. At the nitty gritty, um, you you were quoted as saying um, when you talked about the uh, Woodstock uh, event, you said you'll never be able to convince people that they have to pay for another Woodstock. Now, we know that some of those folks are putting together. I guess tickets are going to go on sale on Earth Day, um, although there's no specifics yet. Just wondering, you know, this could be dated, and we could be look foolish in retrospect, but just wondering what your thoughts are if you're going to get 
<clears throat> people who, you know, 50 years ago, so you've got people in their mid, late 60s and early 70s, are they going to go camping in upstate New York for three days to see? Diehard music fans will. <laughs> I just think they will. I know. I mean, they, maybe not as many as they think, but I, but I think that it's not just, a, it's not about the 50 or 60 year olds. It's about, there's a Woodstock for every generation. Right. And so the people, you know, in 1969 had their Woodstock, but the people that came to the Woodstock that I was involved with were different, but they wanted their own um, Woodstock. They wanted their own experience. They had their own artists that were there that they could relate to. Um, and so there was a little bit of a throwback in the fact that Joe Cocker was there and Carlos Santana and Bob Dylan, but there were all these other artists that were huge at that moment. And I think a lot of people wanted that community spirit, that sense of community in living for the music and what was going on during that two and a half day period. Just your opinion, personal opinion, but so doesn't Coachella fill that void or is it the community aspect of it that he's selling? I think selling? it's the community aspect of it that Woodstock represents. Coachella is a great concert right? and a great experience. I think there's something more about Woodstock. It's the, the legend of it in some ways about that sense of community. And there's always a part that is supposed to be, that's why it doesn't surprise me that tickets are going on sale on Earth Day. Right. There was always that community service part of Woodstock that was important for people as well. Okay, so all right, let's go back to uh, the the career. Um, so you're at Polygram, uh, and you're head of I guess business affairs at Mercury. Mm -hmm. So then what? So. Um, Ed, Ed, Ed Eckstein, who was Ed the president. Ed Eckstein, who uh, basically Col gets fired less than a year after I get there. And they brought in somebody named Danny Goldberg. Now, you would, had a very good job in corporate. Yes. And Ed asked you to help him and be his own. He wanted his own person, which exactly. was you. So you're there. And now, all of a sudden, the guy that dragged you in there is gone. So Correct. Now, so you have a new guy. So now I have a new guy. And he's extremely different from Ed. And, um, you know, Ed was really a serious A&R guy and he had been a producer and he had had his own record label and, um, you know, had, was, had a lot of credibility in the creative oh, was community. It his, his, was it his father? His father was um, a bit, Ed X, not Ed X, Billy, Billy Eckstein was um, a big band singer for years um, and had a fairly successful career. Um, and Ed worked with, um, again, I don't know if you've heard of these artists, but Tony, 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 and Vanessa Williams, and um, we had an artist, Rusted Root, and Joan Osborne, and all of these artists. And Ed was really good, generally, with artists and making records. And Danny came in, and Danny was more of a business guy and had been a manager, and managed Nirvana at one point, among others. Um, the publicist. He, was, he started out as a publicist. He used to talk about how he did the charts for Billboard. Um, and he loved to tell people how he put artists that he really liked on the charts, regardless of what people were saying. And that's probably the publicist in him. Um, and so he was a very different kind of leader. Um, but again, not very long after he got there, Universal came in and bought Polygram. And so things changed pretty quickly after that. And to make a very long story short, I ended up leaving and going to work for Clive Davis at Arista. And Arista at that time was a very hot. It was very hot, label. very established. It had been in business about 24 years. Um, and I thought, after going through all this turmoil of you know, leaving corporate and going to work in business affairs for Ed, and then the next thing I know, Ed's fired, and then uh, Danny came in, and then Universal buys Polygram, and it was insane for a while. And I thought, what could be more stable than going to work for Arista Records? Clive Davis is like one of the most successful record men in history. 
it's just going to be nice and stable and um, after all this craziness, won't that be wonderful? And I was at Arista, I think, six months when BMG decided Clive was too old and he had to leave and a, a major public relations war ensued. Um, but it was also the same year. And when I think about Clive, you know, how old Clive was at the time and they thought he was too old, he was 65, which in this day and age, <laughs> given some of the guys I've worked for, was really young. Um, and so, so uh, by the way, if you say Clive is still working today, Clive, Clive comes into the office every day. He I'm just turned 87 last week. Um, <laughs> And, you know, as Steve knows, Doug Morris just started his own company, and he's 80. And Marty Bandier just left Sony ATV Publishing, and he's starting his own company, and he's 77. So um, record men don't die and <laughs> don't retire. They, they may die eventually, but they don't retire, um, at least not voluntarily. Um, but so... I, the same year that he was asked to leave and he was told he was too old, we won all these Grammys for Santana's Supernatural. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He got a Lifetime Achievement Award for the Grammys, and it was Arista's most successful, most profitable year. But he's too old, we gotta get rid of him. But he's too old, we gotta get rid of him. So before I know it, um, a year and a half into my Arista experience, but, uh, well, the funny thing for me was we also did the 25th anniversary of Arista that year, and um, compared to Woodstock, it was a dream. <laughs> but it was still a very big deal, and we had an NBC special, but I basically brought all my Woodstock experience into that, and I, I just remember like the night before the show or whatever, somebody comes over to me that we had Dick Clark producing, and one of the guys from Dick Clark came running over and saying, you know, Puffy wants to do this big number with, with fire coming out and all this other stuff, what do we do? And I just looked and I said, do we have enough insurance? <laughs> then we're fine. It's like, as long as we're covered, let Puffy do whatever he wants to do. Um, it'll be a great TV moment. Uh, but within a year and a half, we were starting J Records, totally funded by BMG, the company that wanted to throw him out. And we had a lot of success in our first two years to the point where um, BMG ended up buying him out like within two years and making him head of RCA and J and eventually gave him Arista back. So who were some of the artists that, that the old man was not good enough, but he relaunched at Jay? Who were some of those artists? Alicia Keys was one of our first artists. He relaunched the career of Luther Vandross. Um, we always joke about how our first release on Jay was a group called O-Town that we, we worked with MTV on making the band. And... Um, they put together that group, and that album sold two million copies. Um, I'm trying to think of who some of our other big releases were during that period. Clive at one point came to me and said, Julie, we're, we're doing a deal with Rod Stewart for the Great American Songbook. And I looked at him like he was crazy. You know, Rod Stewart during Ger doing Gershwin. Um, the next thing I knew, that album sold several million copies. Um, and completely rejuvenated Rod Stewart's career. Uh, we had an artist called Mario, who was fantastic, who sold millions of copies. Um, I'm trying to think of the biggest artists we had. And then when we merged with RCA, the next thing I knew, I was in Christina Aguilera land, and mm -hmm. Dave Matthews land, and Foo Fighters land, eventually. Um, so it was... So Quite BMG right. merged J with RCA. BMG merged J with RCA when they bought the other half of J, and then eventually they merged Arista um, into, it. into J and RCA and LaFace, which was a joint venture that Clive had originally started with LA and Babyface, went to Jive Records because they had BMG had just bought Jive. And that was another in insane deal, Jive. 
Oh yeah. And that was, um, and then they made Clive head of BMG North America. This right. is the same BMG that wanted to fire him a couple of years earlier. And eventually, um, BMG and Sony merged and became Sony BMG. And a couple of years after that, the guy who was head of Sony BMG at the time decided it really was time for Clive to retire. And at that point, he was mid-70s. And um, he said to him, look, I'll make you chief creative officer. And he called me. I was taking my oldest daughter on a tour of colleges. And the next thing I knew, he called me to tell me, well, I've made Clive head of chief creative officer, I fired his number two, and I'd like to see you in my office this mor next morning. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. Mm. And at that time, he said to me, I fired the head of the global head of business affairs. I fired the general counsel. I fired the COO. So I'd kind of like you to do global business affairs and legal and some of this COO stuff. So I said, uh, OK. <laughs> like, what choice did I have? <laughs> and um, I guess I thought it was the right time to, to go back to corporate and do that job. And that's what I've been doing for the last 11 years, and, almost 11 years. But he didn't stay long. Who? The, the gentleman. From, he oh, stayed for about three years. And then uh, Doug Morris came in. And uh, that was interesting to work for him as well. And how long was Doug there? About six years. And now? And now I work for Rob Stringer, who had been head of uh, Columbia Records, and now he's head of. So it's been almost 11 years, and I'm on my third CEO. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is this the longest place you've stayed at? I think I was, I was at BMG, I guess, the same amount of time, pretty much. Uh, although we, I had different, uh, I always was head of business affairs, but I had different jobs in a way. Like that, we got new catalogs, etc. And I think for me, every time you have a new CEO, your job changes a little bit too. But I think I, this is the longest I've had the same title. Yeah. And luckily, the, my job's different every day. Now, BMG merged with Sony. Right. And then, is it Sony bought out BMG? Sony bought out BMG. Probably about four or five months after I took this job. And BMG said, a German-based company, we don't, we don't want to be in the music business anymore. I think that Sony offered them a good deal. And eventually, BMG went back into right. the music business. They still had their publishing company, but they eventually sold publishing. And then they went back <laughs> into the music publishing business and now kind of lab what we call label services. They put out... I was told I'm putting out about 100 records a year. Yeah, but they have a number of labels that oh, are yeah. part that make up the BMG universe. Um, and it's a very different model. And, but they put out Janet Jackson's last album. Right. OK, so I thought maybe we would resort to some of the questions from some of the students. Sure. OK. Um, hmm. Okay, so Brian wanted to know, did you have any mentors? And if so, what was the biggest lesson you learned from a, from a mentor? Um, I would say for the first third of my career, I really didn't have any mentors. Um, I had a lot of examples of things I didn't want to do. Um, in the sense that I would see people behaving in ways that I knew would never be successful for me. Um, and it made me realize that you just have to be, you have to stay true to who you are as you're going through your career and not try to be anybody else. Um, and I, it wasn't, I think Clive was definitely a mentor. And I didn't really get him until I was 17 years into my career and 11 years into my career in the music business. Um, but I think he was always very supportive. I could fight with him behind the scenes. Um, 
which is what part of my job is, is fighting with my bosses uh, to try to explain to them why they shouldn't be doing something. Um, and, uh, and we just, we to this day have a really good relationship. And I was always amazed at the fact that he was very creative and super smart and started out as a lawyer. And the beauty of Clive was that he didn't pigeonhole you in the sense that he, he basically would ask you to do things that he thought you were good at, not because you were head of business affairs, but because you were you. And um, it, that allowed you to have some really great experiences. Um, and I liked that. It wasn't, uh, you, you only can be in your lane. You can't go out of your lane, and I thought, you know, and I've had certain people that are like that, that like are almost critical if you have an idea, as far as, you're, as far as they're concerned, that's not in your lane. And that's a horrible place to be. Clive was never like that. He, as somebody once said to me, Clive never cared if you were male, female, black, white, gay, straight, as long as you delivered, he was happy. And he was one of those people that would hold the bar up here and there were times that he would ask you to do something and you would sit there and say to yourself, there is no effing way I'm going to be able to get this done. And you get it done and then you say, I am totally screwed because now he's going to expect me to do it again. Um, and so I just think I learned so much from watching him and uh, the way he de dealt with artists and the way he dealt with business. And it always made me laugh because he would almost pretend that he didn't know what was going on outside of the creative and he knew every little detail, every piece of it. And even today, there are times where I see something that he's written and I'm in awe because he's such a great writer and he's so on point um, at 87 years old. So. I've uh, got a question from Christian. Said, and we're asking you for advice for somebody looking to go in the field of entertainment law or music licensing. Uh, okay. For, for music law, I guess you need a law degree. Um, and then after that, I think there are lots of internships at music companies. But what's also interesting is that some of our biggest competitors now for talent are... Amazon, Google, YouTube, Spotify. Um, we're losing a lot of people to all of those tech companies because every tech company wants to do music. Facebook, um, management companies. So what's interesting is that if you do want to go into the music business and into music law or music licensing, the field is more open in many ways than it's ever been. Uh, because there's not a successful tech company out there that doesn't want to do something with music. So the music licensing, it's really about finding an entry-level job. You don't necessarily need a law degree and uh, just starting to learn how to do music licensing and just being a smart person and looking for those jobs. Okay. Did I answer the question? Whoever asked? Question? Yeah. Okay. Um, William, so lengthy question, but <clears throat> it's uh, well known that with age comes wisdom. Comparing it, <laughs> that I would be really wise at this point, and I don't necessarily feel that way. But comparing yourself, starting your career to now, what are some of the characteristics that make someone successful in this business? Have they changed during the course of your career? If so, what skills are more important in the present that weren't as vital previously? And another big question he asks is, how does a, being a woman in a male-dominated industry affect the attributes you specifically need to have? So it's a two-part, I guess. Is what, what or three or four parts. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that one of the most important things that you learn is to learn everything. Because to be successful in the music business, you need to really understand all the different pieces. In many ways, the business is less complicated than it used to be. 
And people would be shocked to hear me say that, but I think it's because um, basically it's a revenue generating business and we pay our artists on revenue and that's, that's it. And that's fairly simple. It's like you pay the artist a percentage of the revenue that comes in. And as long as you're clear that all the revenue that comes in, your artists get a share of, you're done. Whereas there used to be super complicated, convoluted rules on how we paid out our artists and how we paid royalties. And with physical and different stores, you gave out discounts. And the discounts were super complicated. Um, and so personally, I think that the business is a little easier than it was then, as far as to understand how artists get paid, how things work. Um, but I do think that the attribute always is, number one, to have a passion for music. Because if you don't like music, you really shouldn't be in the music business. Number two, and, and it doesn't matter what department you're in either. It could be accounts payable, it could be legal, it could be finance, it doesn't matter. It's really important to have a passion for the music. The other piece of it is, is as I said, to understand all of the different aspects, whether it's how we distribute music, how we um, pay the artists, how we market, how we promote, all of those things. And I don't care what business you're in, I think it's important to really understand that business to make you better at whatever you do. If you're a marketing person, but you don't understand how the artists get paid or how we distribute, you're just not gonna understand how that marketing actually affects what you're doing. The same way with negotiating a contract. If, if you don't understand how the pieces that you negotiate affect how we're gonna be able to market and promote and distribute that artist's music, that's not a good thing. And I think that, so to me, that has never changed. I think that the people who really understand the business are better at their jobs. Um, tell me more of that question because I'm getting. Yeah, no, it was, it was lengthy. Um, <clears throat> what skills are more important in the present than they were in the past? Um, to me, I think that a lot of people got away with not understanding distribution methods, and I don't believe you can do that anymore. Somebody recommended, I don't know how many, it's probably at least 10 years ago, or whatever, saying that all of us should read the business section of the New York Times every single day, because you'd be amazed at how much of that business section affects the music business. And I kind of was a little wary about it until I started doing it. And they were 100% right. Artificial intelligence, affects how we do business. Um, data and privacy affects how we do business. Everything that comes into every telephone company, there is not a telephone company out there that doesn't want to distribute music in some way. Amazon, Google, uh, as I said before, Spotify, Facebook, um, I'm trying to think of what else. All of the investment banks are now suddenly interested in music again. So. There's very little out there that didn't give me more ideas of things that we should be doing or thinking about. Even if you're on the creative side, you know, what's happening in different countries around the world because music is a global, uh, it's a global field. You have to think globally when you're doing things like that um, because you want to be able to connect with fans around the world. Uh, so I don't, I think that um, it's just as important, if not more important, to really understand how all of these businesses affect what you're doing. It didn't, it wasn't as much like that, I would say, when I started. It was very much, we produced discs and we sold them into Walmart or individual record stores and now it's, it's you really, because you, once you put something online, it's global, you need to understand that. And what about the part about being a woman in a male-dominated industry? Does it affect the attributes that you specifically need or have? Fortitude. <laughs> Tenacity and fortitude, I think. Um, and 
even if you decide not to be an asshole, you still have to be tough. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I used to tell people, never mistake kindness for weakness. Ooh, um, that's good. You, it, so you, you have to let a lot of things roll off your back or tell people that you have allergies when you're crying. <laughs> that's the best way to do it. I told people I had allergies a lot of times. <laughs> that's good. <clears throat> Jessica poses the question that, be, that you've worked in both Nashville and New York, and what are some of the differences you've noticed in not only the type of people that work with, but the way the companies run? It is very different in Nashville. What I loved about Nashville, um, and I, uh, I really loved working in Nashville, and it was one of these crazy things where several years ago, my boss decided to let the guy who was running our Nashville company go, and he said to me, okay, Julie, you go down there, you let him go, like, thank you, and um, then why don't you run the company for a couple of weeks, because he was sure we had somebody in place. And I kept saying to him, but this person's not in place. It's not, I don't care, we have to get this done. So two weeks turned into three and a half months, where I was going back and forth between Nashville and New York, and basically running our Nashville company. And the, the difference in Nashville was that it's, in a way, it's a much smaller community, a much more open community, where the artists and the people at the companies are friendly. The artists would come into the, like literally the, the first day I got there, uh, one of the guys said to me, uh, Julie, Tyler Farr is in your office, and he wants to talk to you. And luckily I knew about Redneck Crazy at the time and I was able at least to know who he was. He had a second album about to come out and his, the head of his company is gone. And he just really wanted to talk to me and tell me how much he cared about his career. He really wanted to do well. He understood why Gary had been let go. And, and I said to him, look, I will do everything in my power to make sure that you're successful and that everybody at the company really focuses on your album. And I was so excited that about a month later, a month and a half later, we, his album came out at number one. Not just at number one on the country charts, but number one on the top 200. And that was amazing. And it was really good for the whole company because everybody needed to feel that success. And I think that's the difference between Nashville and New York or Nashville and, and LA. It's that the artists come into the company, the artists like sit down and talk marketing. Um, and maybe Kenny Chesney doesn't do that anymore. Maybe Miranda Lambert doesn't do that anymore, but all of the others do. Um, and Kenny still came in every now and then. And it's a, it's a very different feeling. Um, and, uh, and when I was there, I made some great friends and I, um, but it was really funny, like I would find different writers or producers would just text me and say, I hear you're down here and you're somebody I should meet. And the next thing I knew, I had breakfast with them. Um, and I've been able, it's been three years and I've been able to keep in touch with a lot of them. And, um, and some of the publishers, and it, that's the difference. The difference is it's, it's much uh, more casual in some ways, and there's a lot more in the, the artists feel. It made me feel like I did when we first started J Records, where people would walk into my office, and because it was smaller, and it, we, we had a better relationship with the artists. We were closer to the artists, and that I like. I think I got the pronunciation on Caramo. Uh, was question was, what was your favorite deal that you got to work on? Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch over the years. I, I always talk about how Woodstock was the best and worst thing I ever worked on um, because I learned so much and it also allowed me to put together so much of what I had learned into one big project. Um, doing Adele's renegotiation, that was kind of cool. Um, uh, let's see. I, I actually, it was really funny. Recently, we signed an artist that Mark Ronson and Peter Edge, who's head of RCA, desperately wanted to sign. And we figured out how to do it. And my favorite part of my job over the years, and I haven't been able to do it as much, 
is being there when an artist first gets signed. Because that's so exciting. It's like they're so excited to be signed. There's so much promise. And to be there at the very beginning is the coolest thing in the world. And so we signed this artist called Yeba. And um, she's very independent minded and very strong. And she was working with um, Mark Ronson, who was just one of the nicest people on the planet. And the day she came in to sign and I brought the contracts down, um, she was so excited that she had her family from the South on FaceTime. So she's got her FaceTime. Her father and her brother were there, but her grandmother was on FaceTime. Her, her other sister was on FaceTime, her sister-in-law. And when she was all done, she just was, she was crying. I think I was crying, everybody was crying. And, but the cutest thing was it was a pretty um, rich deal. And she was like, you're all gonna get great Christmas presents this year. Um, that's, to me, that was the, it wasn't the deal so much as the, the excitement of the artists when they first get signed to me is amazing. And some of those artists you, you follow, so it's like Alicia Keys, I feel like is still in my life all these years later, and I met her when she was 18 years old. Um, <laughs> and some, unfortunately, you think they're gonna be the biggest thing on the planet and they end up not being the biggest thing. But um, it's at that moment, everything's possible. And that's the part I like the most. Okay, uh, a little more technical question here from Ashley. <clears throat> How are you seeing the Music Modernization Act affecting the music business, and is there a noticeable change, or will we just have to wait and see? It's really a wait and see. Um, there really, nobody's really noticed anything yet. I think they're still in the process of um, figuring out how it's all gonna work. Uh, I know they're interviewing uh, companies to set up data systems to make the licensing easier. Uh, it's going to take a minute to figure out how it all works. Um, Tyler wanted to know that uh, do most of the legal cases and situations you deal with at work have to do with copyright and selling ownership of content between sound recording and underlying compositions? It's all of the above. It could be that we have a case where somebody says they actually wrote the song and it wasn't the artist that we thought wrote the song or the writer, or there were five writers on the song and we only got permission from four, even though we were told there were only four. Um, we have situations now with copyright termination because those are first coming up. Um, and most of the time we negotiate uh, to make sure that we c we're able to keep distributing the artist. Uh, but there are times where we have a couple of cases now that are trying to test the law to figure out how it will all work. Um, we have your basic cases where people claim we didn't pay them properly. Uh, most of the time that doesn't happen. We're able to work it out, but occasionally it just doesn't work and there's a lawsuit and eventually it gets settled. Um, but it's really all of the above. We've had situations where photographers tell us that nobody got permission to use their photograph. Mm. So it, it's all of the above. And then there are people who appropriate the artwork that you guys own of album covers. Yes, that too. And we have to go after them. Uh, Gina wanted to know what role did you play in Sony's acquisition of Ultra? in 2013? All of it. Um, it. I basically ran that deal and it was a long deal to work out and really working with Patrick Moxie who runs Ultra to make sure he felt comfortable after all the years of being independent being part of Sony again. So for me it wasn't so much even just the deal terms as much as making sure that he felt he had a comfortable home. That's important. Okay, uh, Crystal 
a little complex here, but uh, how do you deal with the issue involving Sony Music as being presented to taking the side of the digital music companies in the rate proceeding before copyright uh, royalty board to, that determines rates for songwriters and composers? This was um, an interesting situation. So uh, the two other majors are very tied to their music publishing companies. And we really weren't at the time. You know, Sony ETV and, and Sony Music are very separate. And traditionally, we had always been involved in the, rate, in the, in the copyright rate proceedings. It wasn't something unusual that we would be involved. Um, the head of the National Music Publishers Association decided that absolutely we should not be involved, we should not be interfering. Um, and not only that, but gave my name out to thousands of songwriters who decided oh. to email me and ask me why I was being such a terrible person. Um, that was really fun. And you, how do you explain to people there's $100? Of that $100, $30 is kept by the distrib distributor. So you have $70 left. Of that $70, let's say almost 15% go to music publishers and songwriters. The rest of it goes to the music company, but it doesn't go to us. It doesn't go in our pocket. Another 20% goes to our artists, either to give them advances or uh, royalties. Another 30% goes to marketing. Then we have our digital operations then we have, I could go on and on, so that we make about a margin, and this is public, about 12%. At the end of the day, the recorded music companies make about 12%. So you think about it, it it's not much of a difference between the 12% that the music company makes and the publishers make that 15, but obviously they pay people, etc. But they don't have the rest of the investment. They don't, they don't make, put up that risk money. And granted, there's no master recording without the underlying composition, but the compositions don't get paid unless we spend, make the investment to put it on a recording on a digital file that then we spend hundreds of millions of dollars promoting and putting it on all the digital services. And all the money we spend or spent in, in investing in digital operations and digital supply chain. And by the way, nobody talks about the fact that Spotify, Apple, Deezer, et cetera, all require different metadata. So you have to make sure that all that metadata gets funneled into all those services. And so suddenly we are evil and bad and whatever, but actually what we were trying to do was be part of this copyright royal tri royalty tribunal that absolutely affected everything we do. So it was, we were never anti-songwriter. I've never been anti-songwriter. Actually, some of my best friends are songwriters. But it's more about the ecosystem. And we, we got out of the case fairly quickly because we settled with the NMPA, which we could have done hopefully before, but unfortunately we weren't able to. But that was, that was why we were involved. Okay. That answer the question? Okay. Good. Uh, I believe this is from Leonardo. He wanted to know, uh, in your current position, what's your opinion on the Taylor Swift deal with UMG regarding Spotify payouts, and how come Sony didn't offer her a deal? Um, well, actually, the interesting thing is where she got the Spotify idea, kind of, was because that's how we paid our artists. Um, and she basically said to Universal, if I re-sign with you, you have to pay out all your artists the way Sony just paid their artists. Um, and we made payments to our artists when we sold um, our 50% of our Spotify holdings. Uh, we paid it through without regard to whether they were unrecouped or not. Um, in addition to making sure that we, uh, our iconic artists got some money out of the deal as well as the artists that do really well in digital. Um, of course we tried to sign Taylor Swift. We'd be crazy not to try to sign her. Um, 
I'm sh every company was after Taylor Swift. Um, but, you know, Universal has her catalog and they, she's been working with those guys for a really long time. So they clearly had the edge. Yeah. <clears throat> Paul poses this question. Well, it's a statement, too. That live will always be the bread maker. How does the independent artist fare in an environment where even the assigned artist is having trouble recouping and making profit from their recorded music? Basically, he's asking, will recorded music ever return to serve as a reliable revenue stream? For some artists, it does. I think that um, there are some artists. It's not... It's going to become more reliable because as the number of paid subscribers grow, you have more and more uh, uh, people that are subscribing and you know that there's going to be a certain amount of money every month that comes in. Uh, what's interesting is it's not albums. It could be, you know, a few years ago we were renegotiating one of our biggest streaming artists deal and he was one of the first artists to be huge on streaming services. And I remember talking to the person who's now my current boss. Uh, we were talking about the proposal that we got for his renegotiation. And renegotiation is when an artist is successful and they come in and they say, you know, I don't want this crap deal anymore that you gave me when I was a nobody. I want you to pay me lots of money because I'm much more successful. And so we do, generally. And so we got a proposal that was fairly significant. And... Uh, this person said to me, but I don't understand why he would send me, you know, he would send us this proposal. He only sold two million albums. And I said, but you understand that he also made the equivalent of another two million through his Spotify revenue. And I think that was like an epiphany. What do you mean? I said, basically, he made the equivalent money of another two million albums on Spotify but 97% of that was from four songs. Hmm. And it, it was, it, and this was, I think, four or five years ago. And that was the beginning of us realizing that there are artists who really do make a lot of money through streaming. It, it's a lot of streaming that you have to uh, have to make that money. The hardest part is for people who were used to selling albums uh, most of the streaming services skew really young. So whatever music is really attractive to a younger skewing audience is, what's, is what streams. You know, Bob Dylan's manager says, screw Spotify, because people on Spotify are not streaming Dylan as much as he might like. Um, but I think that there are artists that are doing really well through streaming services and they're recouping. And they, um, I think they do make a fair amount of money from live as well. But independent artists are starting to do really well on streaming services. Yeah. Um, so I think it's across the board. Yeah? Who is the artist? I can't tell you. Oh, what? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jacqueline wanted to ask you, what does a day in the life of Julie Swidler typically look like? Or isn't it not a typical day? Well, the typical day is you wake up at either 5.45 or 6 o'clock because you want to make sure that you exercise <laughs> before you get to work um, and read the business section of the New York Times. And then um, there is no typical day. It could be anything from a breakfast, meeting? A breakfast meeting. It could be uh, reviewing... Uh, a complaint that we want to serve. It could be a big negotiation. It could be, let's talk about aspects of this digital deal. Will it work for our artists? Will it work for us? We're about to renegotiate. It could be renegotiating um, a big artist deal. Uh, because at this point, I only get involved, I don't get involved that often in the new artist deals. I get involved more when we re really want to sign a re-sign a big artist, then I would get involved. Um, a, it could be that we're making acquisitions in different areas, and we'll take a look at the acquisition. Is it really something we should be in or not? Um, even to the point of thinking of our community service, you know, social responsibility. Are there things that we should be doing in the community 
that we're not doing right now. Uh, we're going to make a lot of money from Spotify. What do we do with it? How do we pay the artists? What do we think is the fairest way to pay? Um, Ten years ago, working on something that said, we have this new thing called streaming. It's this video streaming, and the only way we're getting paid on video streaming is these big advances. And it's against little tiny pennies from, from each video, but how do we pay the artists? Because we really don't know the value of a stream. Let's make sure that we pay them at the end based on our unrecoup balances. Um, but it's things like that that you have to think about all the time. We just revamped our entire artist agreement because I always describe it as a piece of software that we've been putting patches on for years and it's ridiculous and it made no sense in the current environment and we were still distinguishing between physical and digital when there shouldn't be any distinction anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, I was talking to you before about global, thinking globally. If we want our artists, you know, our job is to sign the world's most creative artists, develop them and break them globally. So if you don't think globally, that's not very good. You want to make sure that the message to your artists, for years we paid artists less outside the home territory. Or if U.S. was the home territory, we'd pay the artists less. That never made sense to me. That's a bad message to send to artists. Luckily, I have a boss that supported me, and now we pay one rate globally. It's those wow. kinds of things that... Um, Most companies doing that now? I think we're the first. Um, so I think it's just... It's, it's every day trying to, trying to get ahead of things in a way. You know, think about what may be down the block. What should we be thinking about now? And, and I think that's something that we learned in 2000 when Napster came in and everybody freaked out. And I think now everybody in the music business is trying to figure out how do we prepare ourselves for the next thing? Because while music streaming is growing and we're very happy about it, Odds are tomorrow there's going to be something else. You know, everybody thought vinyl was really cool, and then it was the cassette, and then, believe it or not, there were eight-track tapes, and then the CD, and everybody was really excited. Um, so I think it constantly changes how music is consumed. So how do you put yourself in the best position possible for all the different changes? And that's something we talk about a lot. So every day is really different. But at the core of everything we do, is the music. Because if the music isn't great, it doesn't matter anything else we do. It doesn't matter. Um, we have some limited time left, so I want to make sure anyone has a question. I still have more here, but if anyone there has a question, please feel free to raise your hand. And I mean, yeah. yes. Uh, hi. Um, so you say that um, in earlier, um, you said that music and business go hand in hand, but and uh, also I believe music and technology. So for when you are looking to expand or looking to how to, you know, serve your artists, do you also think about, you know, what ways can you get involved in more technology or like for your community, like uh, what's it called, service? Do you also think about those things too? Or I think artists and music have to be at the core of everything we do, whether it's technology or community service, anything we do, it would be music and artist related because that's what we do. That's who we are. Um, Clive once said something many years ago, and I, I reminded him of the fact that he said it recently because I think he was 100% right, even though I'm sure people poo-pooed it at the time, was, which is he said, I never care about the distribution method. I only care really about whether it's great music. If it's great music, we will figure out the distribution method later, but it's got to be great music. And I'm sure people looked at him like, oh, you're a dinosaur, you need to figure out digital, you need to figure out whatever. Yes, it's important to figure out digital and the best way to work with digital companies because you need to get your music out there but if you're at the creative core of the company, the most important thing for you is Khalid is amazing. Khalid would be amazing whether we had Spotify or Walmart or anything else. He's amazing. So, and so the people that work with Khalid, they're focused on him. They're focused on what is his vision next. 
He wants to put it on EP. The good part, in a way, about streaming services is that it's democratized music in a way that we've never been able to, to do before. If an artist wants to put out a track a week, you know, at one point the Chainsmokers decided to put out a new track a month. Great. Not a problem. If Khalid decides, you know, before my next album, I have this concept of an EP, and I'm going to call it Sun City, and it's about where I grew up, and et cetera, and it's how my hometown makes me feel. Great. We can do that. We, we're not tied to saying to the artist, well, actually, you goddamn better deliver to us 12 tracks. And, and there was a period of time where when we had CDs, a lot of artists, particularly hip hop artists, insisted we put 18 tracks on that CD. One, because they were prolific. Two, because they felt like if somebody's paying the money for a CD, they want to give them as much as possible. I remember having the most bizarre conversation with Buster Rhymes because I had to talk to him about how there had to be enough time on the CD for pre-pause. I had no idea what pre-pause was like two days before, but suddenly people were freaking out saying, we don't have enough room on the CD for all the music that Buster wants. Now we don't have to worry. If Chris Brown wants to put out 40 tracks, guess what? He can do it. And people get the choice of deciding how much of that music they like and want to press play. So that's the beauty of the new distribution model. Um, it, it almost gives artists more freedom in some ways. With Adele, when she put her album out, she felt very strongly that it was a body of work. And so did not necessarily want it all to be on streaming services from day one. But her next album, she probably won't have a choice. She'll probably put it up on streaming services immediately. And hopefully people will listen to the full album. Any other questions? A little shy to it. Sir. Yeah, just in terms of um, the term of an artist contract, mm -hmm. it used to be years or like seven albums. But now if they're putting out playlists or just a song a month, what are you equating to be an album now? I think it goes back to, um, it, you know, when I first got into the music business, it was like eight to 12 albums. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it definitely has shortened dramatically since then. Um, but I think now what we do is it's a certain number of masters. Certain, actually, actually, that's not true. In our new form, about a year ago, Pharrell came to talk to us and he, Everybody asked him what are the things that really bothered him. And for years, in the music business, the original recording was called the master recording. And it went back to technological uh, things. There was, a, there was an, a master and a slave in the music, in, in how you recorded music. And Pharrell said, I hate that. The word master should not be in a recording contract. So we actually took it out. And now we call it artist, or artist recordings. And it's hard because everybody's so used to saying mass That's recording. And, for, and it never would have occurred to me. And a lot of the people in the company were surprised. that, But he felt so strongly about it that I felt like if he feels this strongly about it, then, then we'll come up with something different. We have to because that's the whole point. Um, but now on recordings, it goes by... If it, it usually we go back to they can they can deliver between 10 and 12. Sometimes we'll say if you want to deliver an EP and then maybe another EP and an EP is usually five to six tracks. Um, but it's still based on delivery because that's the one thing we get is delivery of music. And so the question is, how much delivery do we need to give the artists the money they're looking for? depending on what kind of advances they want, how much it costs them to record each song. Some deals we say you only have to deliver three, and then we'll see what happens, and maybe we'll do more after that. Um, we're trying to be much more, much more flexible in this world, so it's not an album. We've, we've, at least we have really taken away, gone away from the album concept. If an artist wants to deliver an album, great, but they don't have to. We're coming down the home stretch. <clears throat> I know you had another question, didn't you? Yeah. I, uh, I did. Um, 
So personally, I feel like the degree music business is just really new because before people who have actually been in the business, they had to learn. You didn't have to go to college or learn about it, you just lived it. So what do you look for for people that you are wanting to like hire or you want new talent or people around you that are learning or got a bit like a degree in the music business or marketing or management? What are you looking for them? Because they're already, you know, doing these seminars, taking these classes. But what aside from that are you looking for? What qualities? Again, a passion for music. I think that depending on the area you want to go into, a passion for that area. Um, so I think I know sometimes a turnoff is people who come in who are passionate about music but, but don't have any idea where they want to go. I think a lot of people look for somebody who says, you know, I really love the press aspect. Now once you get in and you're doing press, it may turn out that you're really good at A&R. It may turn out you're really good at marketing. I mean, people started, my boss turned, started in marketing but really wanted to grow, and he knew in order to be where he wanted to be in the music business, he had to do A&R. He had to prove himself in signing artists that became successful. So I think it's, um, it's the different aspects of, of what you want to do. If, if you do um, marketing here, that almost makes it easier for you because then you know that that's where you're going to direct your... Um, uh, energies. I think that what we look for is just super passionate, organized, smart people. And hopefully they're creative in whatever area they do. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're in marketing, press, etc. Every one of our departments, you have to have that creativity. Yes, sir. Um, uh, well, now that, like, music is being consumed so much, especially with like streaming, and there's like so many new artists. Uh, do you feel like it's easier for an artist to be overlooked just because of how much content there is? Or do you feel like because the audience has become so broad, it's easier for an artist to put music out and get listens? No, I think sometimes it's harder because there is so much available. It's, you know, one of the guys that I used to work with um, used to talk about cutting through the clutter. Right? You have to cut through the clutter. What's going to cut through the clutter? And I think our job is even harder because we have the artists, these artists that we absolutely are passionate about because we're not going to spend money on an artist we're not passionate about. So anybody that we sign, we think they are going to be the biggest artist on the planet. I mean, my husband still teases me about an artist that we had years ago when I was at Polygram called The Triplets. And we were so sure they were going to be the biggest thing on the planet. Um, and it, there were so many artists that came along over the years that I loved that for whatever reason, we were passionate about them in our building. And somehow when we put it out there, the rest of the world wasn't as passionate about them as we were. And it, so it makes it a little bit harder. Again, it goes back to that creativity we, heard, we thought about. The kinds of things we're doing now to cut through that clutter <laughs> are like this. Right? We used to have these plans where we would, the artist might start touring little clubs, start building a little bit of a fan base, start building the buzz, and we still do that, but how do we make it bigger, right? How do we make sure that they get on the right playlists? How do we make sure that outside of these services, you know, a lot of times the services make it sound like, oh, you just get on our playlist, that'll be the end of it. Not really. We need to make sure that the dots are connected, that if you listen on a playlist or whatever, that you really start learning about that artist because we want it to be more than just a song. Because if it's just a song, you may not necessarily care the next time that artist puts out a song. So how do you connect with the artist themselves? That's really important is making that connection. And so we have more tools available to us than we ever have before. And we now try to use a lot of the data that we get to figure out, you know what? For whatever reason, we signed this artist in the US, but Italy is going crazy over this artist. And so maybe we really should be focusing on Italy right now, and I'm making this up, but 
We focus on Italy because if we can make this artist really big in Italy, it may pass, it may go along. I, I like to give the example of Omi's cheerleader because you had Omi, who's Jamaican, who had this song, who had it remixed by a German mixer, and it broke out of Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. And it became the hugest song that summer. But if you think about the road to how it became successful, it traveled the globe, practically. And, it was, and to me, that was a great example of our new world of how that song became successful. OK, um, <clears throat> I promised you you'd get home at a reasonable hour because you have your 5.30 uh, exercise. <laughs> I'm fading already, yeah. So um, I want to thank you for coming here. And we're of very course. blessed to have you. <laughs> <laughs>